Again, I would thank you all for being so um, so gracious to the, my, my fill-in last week. It was very great for you all to be an encouragement to him and to allow him to come and to speak and to preach. He doesn't get to preach often, but uh, I hear he does a good job when he does. Last week I was at Crossroads Baptist Church in the North Wilmington area near Laney High School, and I um, appreciated my chance to go and to share with them. I shared with them um, him eighty or Psalm 88, which is what I believe to be the saddest chapter in all of the Bible. It ends with no light at the end of the tunnel, and I shared with them how I believe Christ would transform that, that particular psalm to give us great hope where there is not always great hope hope. Um, So this would be the last day that I would be preaching through the book of Jonah. And some of you, as you've heard me preach the last four times, would say, thank God this is the last time you're preaching through the book of Jonah because you've been very redundant. Um, I have really enjoyed getting to preach through this for you guys, and and I hope that you've seen a picture of God's gospel in all of it. But today we're going to look at the chapter that if it were if it were a fairy tale or, or some sort of fictional account, I don't think this chapter 4 would be here. Um, we get to see right to the very, very heart and soul of a prophet who is still, to an extent, living in rebellion. He is still living in rebellion, even though he went through the motions that looked like great obedience. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever been asked to do something in church and you knew that you knew certainly God wasn't calling you to do it and your flesh didn't want to do it, but you went through the motions anyway? You ever do it and it turned out okay and you still felt bad about it? You still felt downright weary or tired or regretful over the entire situation? Have you ever been rebellious? Knowing that God was calling you to do something, and you didn't do. This chapter strikes close to my heart because it reveals to me, when I read it, my own idolatry and my own selfishness. And I I hope today, and this is a strange hope that I have for you all, but I hope that it reveals to you all your own selfishness and idolatry so we together as God's people can repent and clearly see that Jesus has a much better way for us than we have for ourselves. If we were to do a very quick walkthrough to lead us back to chapter 4, we would see in the book of Jonah, it begins with a prophet of God who was a prophet at a time of great prosperity in the nation of Israel being called to go to the big, mighty mean, nasty nation of Nineveh. God called Jonah to go to share with them that judgment was on the way. Jonah said no. And Jonah attempted to escape from the very presence of God. And Jonah was reminded through the entire way. At least I thought he was reminded. But it doesn't seem like he he really got it. At least not fully. He was reminded each and every step of the way that God's presence was already out in front of him. As Jonah said no and fled to Tarshish, instead of going to Nineveh, he got on a boat and the the punishment, there there was a little bit of judgment that we see being cast down upon Jonah for his disobedience. And while he's on the boat, a big storm comes and no one can figure out why the storm came, but everyone knows that the storm has happened supernaturally. Even those that were non-believers knew that something weird was happening. The weirdest thing to me in the whole book, or the whole chapter there, and that whole, that whole account, is that Jonah's taking a nap when all of this goes down. Jonah comes clean to those that are on the ship and says, it's, it's my fault. I am in disobedience. Um, the, the, the judgment, the punishment would be that you would throw me overboard. And in that... In a strange, miraculous way that only God can do, those sailors worshipped the true God of the Bible as Jonah was thrown overboard to die. 
But if any of you have seen Veggie Tales, you know that Jonah doesn't die when he's thrown off the ship. He, he gets swallowed by a, a large fish or, or a sea beast of some sort. And according to other cartoons and Veggie Tales, it's kind of a comfy situation where he could have his campfire and all that there. And he's just riding the thing out. And not sure that's how it is. But in, in the belly of the great fish, in the depths of the ocean, as he's gone down to where he can't go down any further without being dead. Jonah lifts up one of the most beautiful prayers in all of the Bible and repents. And he he repents of of being unwilling to follow God's will. And so for a moment, we see that Jonah's heart is turned toward God. And God in His mighty plan has the, the great beast, the great fish, spit Jonah out on the land. And God says again, Jonah go to Nineveh. And this time, Jonah says, okay. Jonah goes and we see what perhaps could be the greatest revival in all of human history in Nineveh, where hundreds of thousands were were saved. Some commentators would say otherwise. I believe that they saw the glory of God in that particular moment of of what's called, with a a stepped revelation throughout the Bible, the, the, the stepped glory building toward Jesus, progressive revelation. In that moment, I believe that the people of Nineveh, from the king, from the top, down to the bottom, saw in lump, in mass, as a whole, the glory of God. As I pointed out a few weeks ago, what was, what was of note to me was that they weren't sure that judgment still wasn't coming, but they repented anyway. They weren't sure they were going to be saved from the coming judgment, but they repented anyway because they saw God's glory, which was a mirror of Jonah in the belly of the fish, not knowing whether or not he was going to live or die. He still gave all due glory to the one do that glory in God. Jonah goes and he he preaches and you would think the story would end if, if it were me. Let me tell you a little bit about my my hopes and my prideful, my sinfully prideful ambitions. I have always wanted to be not just the the megachurch pastor, the the next big thing, but the next big thing that would be the next global big thing. I've always wanted to be the spark of the next great revival. And And in my own mind, sometimes I get so caught up in my own ambitions that if I'm not that, I'm a failure. So my heart is maybe the opposite of where Jonah's heart is. I would love to be sent to a city like Nineveh, New York City. Some of these these cities all over the globe where it's illegal to be a Christian, to be used of God, to see them see the glory of Jesus. But let me tell you how that's sinful in my own life. Because I don't want it to be anybody but me. I want to be the spark. I, I, I wrestle with this constantly. If, if there was a great spark of revival, would, would I be the best cheerleader that I could be? Would I be the best second man that I could be? Would I be the best behind the scenes supporter that I could be? Or would I just shake my fist at God and say, God, I could do better than him? Jonah had an opposite but similar reaction. In Jonah chapter 4, we're going to cover the whole chapter this morning, but I'm just going to read a handful of verses. Pick up with me in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. And if you had never read this before, this would be the moment of surprise. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, which by the way, is at least he knows who to speak to. At least in his brokenness and his anger, at least he knows who to cry out to. There are many around the world today that don't even know that much. He cried out to the Lord. He said, please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarsus in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, that you're slow to anger. You're rich in faithful love. You're the one who relents from sending the disasters. And now, and now, Lord, 
Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And then the Lord asked what might be the most sarcastic question God has ever asked. Is it right for you to be angry? Would you pray with me? Father God, as we walk through this this last chapter of Jonah, would you, would you make it just ring out in our soul that it is not right for us to be angry? God, that you are the God that is a God to all glory and honor, whether we have good days or bad days, whether we get our way or not, that you are a great God. God, would you move, whether it be through your messenger this morning or in spite of it, would you allow the people of Cape Fear Baptist Church this morning to see the beauty of the gospel, to see the beauty of your, the fullness of your character, from grace and mercy all the way over to justice and wrath? Would you allow all of us together to celebrate how great you are and how great we're not? It's all in the name of Jesus that I pray this morning. Amen. So in the most surprising turn of events that you you could possibly see in a story like this, Jonah's upset. Again, I'll tell you again. Biggest revival, greatest revival in the history of mankind, maybe. And Jonah's mad. And he he tells God, just to remind him in case he forgot or didn't realize it or something, God, this is why I ran in the first place. Truth be told, Jonah did not want to. God's grace to fall upon Nineveh. Jonah did not want those folks in Nineveh to hear about the greatness of God. He would have rather them be judged and killed in ignorance. Isn't that heartbreaking? That this man who was a prophet, this man who was probably fairly well off compared to other prophets, didn't want to share the spiritual wealth of what they had come to know. He didn't want to do what he was called to do as a Jew. The people of Israel were set apart to constantly talk about the coming one. They were set apart with the purpose. Set apart with the purpose of declaring the glory of God. That salvation will come by God through Jesus. And Jonah is mad at God because God is God. Jonah is mad at God because God is God. Jonah, as we walk through this passage, he quotes a a very familiar passage, probably to God because God ordained it to be written, but, but to many Jews that would read this later. And it should be to us. He's quoting Exodus 34. And he's saying, God, I know that you're the God of mercy. That's why I didn't want you to go. Or that's why I didn't want to go. I know that you're the God of compassion. It's it's important to note here in that section, those first three verses, when he starts to say, I know that you're the God that's merciful and compassionate. He, He doesn't fully quote the verse. He leaves out the part that says that God is also a God of justice. Now, some commentators would say that it's almost as though God or Jonah was challenging God like I will acknowledge you're the God of justice when you take back saving those people or maybe Jonah left out that part about God being the God of justice because Jonah knows as a prophet Jonah knows as a well-versed scholar that God's justice should fall on him and his rebellion as well either way Jonah leaves that out and says I didn't want to go because I knew what you were going to do. Isn't that sad? These divine attributes that Jonah cites are are taken from the well-known list in, in Exodus 34 and they're repeated a number of times in Scripture. Jonah does not wish God to be true to who God is. Or at least he wishes that God be not so generous with his merciful attributes. And I would add to this quote that I'm reading his be not so generous with his merciful attributes to others, but a little more liberal to others 
with his attributes of justice and wrath. Something noticeably missing from Jonah's list, but not from Exodus 34 or Numbers 14 or the rest of them, is the discussion of justice. Jonah quotes God's word back to God, and it becomes evident how blind Jonah is in his anger and his sadness. Jonah just did something miraculous, and he says, I told you I didn't want to come because I didn't want to see you save those people. For the sake of brevity, and for the sake of just cutting right to the quick of the matter, Jonah just simply didn't believe that the Ninevites were worthy of God's grace. He didn't just not want to go. He probably didn't want anybody to go. So you can remove all those the speculation of maybe he was just scared he would be killed. That's just part of it. Whether he was killed or not, he didn't want to see them be forgiven. He didn't want to see them have a chance to respond to the great and holy one that he was proclaiming his entire life. He didn't want anyone to share with the Ninevites the fact that God's wrath is real and that God's mercy is real as well. Here's why I believe Jonah did not want to see God's grace and mercy fall upon Nineveh. Number one, I said this every week building toward this moment. He was extremely nationalistic. Um, that's a very polite phrase for racist. He was extremely nationalistic. He, he loved his culture. He was a leader in a time of prosperity. And just by virtue of sheer economics, if the city of Nineveh repents and they become peaceful, then the city of Nineveh, being a mega, mega, mega metropolis, will then become a, a, a center of trade, a center of commerce. And all of those temporal, temporary blessings may not be shunted through Israel for a period. And I don't know how to put this any other way. It is not okay to put your race or your nation above Jesus. That's my polite way for saying it is not okay to be racist. If, if you're here this morning, you, you living in the Bible belt like, like I do, we all have this to deal with. And the first one that would jump up and say, I don't have this to deal with, is the one that has it to deal with the most. The Bible says that salvation is extended to peoples from every tribe, and nation, and tongue. That means that the gospel is for everyone. In the New Testament, it is clear that God does not make a distinction among the races at all. It's saved in Christ and in Christ alone, or not saved. Those are the two types of people. It's really two types of sinner. A sinner that recognizes his brokenness and finds Jesus, or a sinner that doesn't. There's no other difference I served at a church for a very short period of time that believed that they, they really and truly believed that people that were not of European descent were unable to be saved. That only white folks could go to heaven. That means Jesus probably isn't there because he was a Hebrew. He looked more like, like Osama bin Laden or, or like one of the presidents of Israel now than he looks like any of us. One of the great sins that we don't talk about in the southern church is the sin of racism. And it cuts both ways, and I get that, but that doesn't absolve us from seeking Christ and saying, God, in your Holy Spirit, please give me a love that I don't have on my own for the nations. Living in Christ and in Christ alone, hear me on this, listen to me. If you're in Christ, you should be filled with this burden for the nations. And it starts here. It starts in your, your neighborhood and your community. It, it starts by, by maybe remedying some of those trite, rude, racist things that we, we say in passing. Jonah was incredibly nationalistic and did not want to see another nation get, get saved by God. He wanted to keep all of the blessings for his nation and his people. Racism is a sin that is worthy of repentance. And I stand behind that, and the Bible says it, and it says it clearly. 
that the, the gospel is for every tribe, nation, people, and tongue, and that's something we all have to work out living where we do in the culture that we do. The Bible tells us that we will all worship at the end of times and when, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, we will all be worshiping the Savior together. Number two, he wasn't just extremely nationalistic. Um, in his heart, in his brain, in his soul, he had forgotten about God's mercy to him. Doesn't that sound crazy? Knowing just the four chapters of this story, it seems as though Jonah had forgotten about the magnitude and the extent of God's merciful grace. As a prophet, he saw God's grace and mercy. Being called to Nineveh when he didn't go, he saw God's grace and being saved from being thrown overboard, being swallowed by a beast, being spit out. He saw God's grace and mercy. And it's almost like after he went through the city and saw God's grace and mercy all around him in, a, in just a quizzical way, you would expect him to die. Going to Nineveh and walking in and saying, repent, judgment is coming. You would think he would probably die knowing that culture. But he lived and they found God. And he's mad. It's almost as though he forgets, forgets about the greatness and the largeness of God. And he forgets about the mercy that God has shown to him. Which, by the way, made him the perfect messenger for Nineveh. Being the repentant prophet. Number three, maybe he'd forgotten about God's mercy to the Jews or he had not forgotten about God's mercy to the Jews and he did not want that extended to anyone else. Ultimately, no matter how you view that, I believe that Jonah is plagued with a disease. That disease is called sin. Specifically, his sin is the sin of idolatry, of putting something like your racial makeup as your identity over everything else. Making his identity over as a prophet, possibly, during a prosperous, a prosperous time, maybe was his, his great idol. Maybe he just thought that he and his people were downright better than the rowdy, murderous crowd that you find in Nineveh. This idolatry that Jonah suffers from is the same idolatry that I believe the original sin that Adam and Eve committed when they thought that they... They knew better than God after finding counsel from Satan. Thought they knew better than God, so they went and did the one thing God told them not to do. What does idolatry always lead to? Disobedience. Idolatry always leads to disobedience. Adam and Eve disobeyed. Jonah disobeyed. We disobey when we bow down to other altars. And no, it doesn't mean bowing down to a statue. Idolatry is putting something above the Lord Jesus Christ. We all do it, and we all need to repent of it when we do those things. The sin of thinking we know better than God is idolatry. And sometimes we want to, to out-God God in a sense that we want to maybe help God along or maybe, maybe help God strategize a little better than, than maybe we think God strategized in something. Now having obeyed, Jonah is still unhappy and says once more that he would rather die and just get it all over with. It is a warning to all of us, hear me on this, it's a warning to all of us that it is possible, that it is possible to obey God, but to do it with such a degree of unwillingness and anger that is insofar as, as we are concerned and God will be concerned, that obedience is no better than disobedience. Because God wants you not to obey just to go through the motions he wants you to have a radical obedience that would be the overflow of a love for him. That obedience would almost be a compulsion. Let's look quickly at Jonah's third chance that he gets. I'm going to read it to you and I'm going to quickly talk about it and then we'll be done. Before I read it, Jonah gets a third chance to see how sinful he is. A third chance. He runs, gets spit out in Nineveh, tells God he's angry. He gets, he gets a chance by God just asking the question, and then he gets this object lesson, as, as the great Spurgeon calls it. Verse 5, Jonah left the city and sat down east of it. He made himself a shelter there. That word shelter is ironic in a sense, because that word would mean um, 
it, it, it's the same word they used when they built little things that would be a tribute to God um, in times before Jonah. So he built himself a shelter that would almost be like a worship to the God that he's running from there. And he sat down in the shade to see what would happen to the city. He was hoping that God would change his mind and bring judgment. And then the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for him and his, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. Let me, let me make an insertion right there. Jonah was greatly displeased in verse 1 because God shown favor upon Nineveh. And now Jonah is greatly pleased because he gets a plant to give him some shade. Um, let me go down to verse 8. As the sun was rising, God appointed a... a score. Let, me, let me actually back up, I'm sorry. When dawn came the next day, in verse 7, God appointed a worm that would attack the plant and it withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah's so dramatic. He, he's a drama queen of prophets. Verse 9... God asked again, is it right for you to be angry this time about the plant? And Jonah replied and he said, yes, yes, it's right. I'm angry enough to die. So the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and you didn't grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. Should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people that cannot distinguish their right from their left, as well as many animals? Commentators are split as to what that 120,000 would mean, but I'm, I'm fairly certain and I'm confident to say that there were more than 120,000 living in the city. So that, that phrase and that verbiage would refer to children. So let me put it in a way that's more understandable to us. Jonah, you would care more about that plant that would keep you from getting sunburned than you would about the 120,000 children that were in Nineveh. And I'm sad to say that as this story stops, I myself find, find myself where Jonah is so often, but unwilling to admit it. Just willing to shake my fist at God and say, yeah, I have every right to be angry. You didn't give me the church I wanted. You didn't give me this. You didn't make Cape Fear Baptist Church what I wanted you to make it. And the story just stops. We don't know how Jonah responds. We don't know if he responds with great repentance or if he sits there and dies watching Nineveh. But as it stops, we see Jonah's soul almost ripped out of his body and exposed so the readers of this book can see the very depth and depravity of selfishness and idolatry. We see Jonah finding great pleasure and comfort and great displeasure with following God's will. Things don't turn out as we wish, so we would like to justify our disobedience. We need to learn, according to James Boyce, that we are not sufficient to pass on the appropriate or inappropriateness of the outcome. We are not sufficient to make a judgment on how appropriate or inappropriate an outcome might be. Nor are we responsible for it. We are responsible only for, for, for performing the whole will of God. Having such an encounter with God Almighty through Jesus, like Jonah had with God Almighty pre-Jesus, should be life-changing. It should give us an indescribable joy and also at the same time an indescribable gravity to go and to tell the world that God is God and that Jesus is the way. Not just those who we think would be a good candidate for salvation because they look like us or they could benefit our church. But we often act the same way. When we look like we're obeying God, we're just going through the motions. We secretly, when we're just going through these motions, we're unhappy and angry with God for making these requirements 
of us. For this reason, many Christians might look on the outside or the inside of a church that they are being obedient. They may look like that, but how they act, how they act at home and how they act in general would show you exactly how miserable and angry they are. And I could tell you story after story after story of people that would resonate with this. People that would seemingly be obedient to church, but would be wolves. People that would look like they were doing God's work, but would have no idea what God's work is. And hear me on this, I don't think Jonah was a wolf. I think Jonah knew who to pray to, and I I give Jonah this much credit for at least being honest with God, because many of us in this room won't go that far. And as I round toward home and toward, toward the finish, I would say this. If you wonder why I wanted to preach this book to, to you all as Cape Fear Baptist Church, um, maybe I can personalize it a little bit for you. I, I felt led of God to preach this book to, to you all, whomever would come, whether it be 2 or 20 or, or whomever would come, to confront a church in transition with the fact that church people get caught up in rebellion very often, but it masks itself with church work or a a fake way of acting pious or godly or faking interest in the life of the church when really the only great interest is in maintaining what you want, not what God wants. Every year at at Yom Kippur, the Jews get together in, in synagogues and they still do this and they read the book of Jonah. It's read out loud and at the end, They say, I am Jonah, in unison. They stand up together and they say, I am Jonah. And it's ironic how much like Jonah they are because they still refuse, as being non-Christian folks, they still refuse to see that Jesus was the way of salvation that their people have been proclaiming for millennia. But more, more piercing to us, should be that we are Jonah. More piercing to us should be that we too, as followers of Christ, are people that that live in disobedience. That that want to say the right things and do the right things, but not if it comes at the cost of their being changed. Or people that look different, or or speak differently, or or have a different type of, of culture. We are Jonah. J.D. Greer says that Jonah is the religious person who is daily confronted with the question of whether or not they'll leave everything they know and follow God on a daily basis. So I would confront you with that question. Are you willing to leave everything that you know on a daily basis to be ready and willing at any moment to respond to the call of God? The great Adoniram Judson, as he was writing one of his very last letters. He was, he was a, a trailblazing missionary to a place that had no churches and no evangelical witness. He was writing in a letter, and this may be confusing because some of the language is old, but, but hear the heart behind this. He's writing a letter to his wife to share with others, almost describing why he did what he did in terms of being a missionary. But surely, if any sin will, will give you the crushing weight on our trembling, shrinking souls when death is near. If anything would give us a burden as our life draws near to a close and we get older, if any sin would stand out above the rest, is what he's saying. If any sin will clothe the face of the final judge with an angry frown, withering up the last hope of the condemned and irredeemable everlasting despair, despair, It is the sin, it is the sin of turning a deaf ear to the plaintive cry of millions of immortal beings who by their darkness and their misery cry day and night whether they do it literally or metaphorically. And then he gives this great call to the mission field. He says, they are crying out to you because they need Jesus. And they're saying, come to our rescue, you sons and daughters of God. Come and save us. Because we are sinking into the very pits of hell. We 
When we encounter the indescribable glory of God, we should be given an indescribable weight of responsibility. And in that is this weight of being obedient. The weight of repenting when we are disobedient because it's going to happen. And the weight of getting those things as right as we possibly can so we can show the world that God is good. The story of Jonah is that we are Jonah and that we all as humanity must seek the good and better Jonah in Jesus Christ. The one that sank down to the very depths of of death and hell not because of His sinfulness, but because of our sinfulness. The one who was born three days later, the one who ascended on high and sat to God's right hand to be our advocate. The book of Jonah should point us to the good and better Jonah in Christ and our need for a Savior, lest we just sit at the beach in our own little shack and cry every time a plant grows and dies and squabble every time the wind blows the wrong way. And find no peace. My last statement I'll make is it, is it is incredible to me that even through a rebellious and reluctant prophet, God saved an entire city. We all live in a town Count Wilmington in this area, not nearly as big as Nineveh. Got way more churches, way more believers than Nineveh ever had. There was one man that showed up. How would you respond to something like the book of Jonah? That, that my prayer has been that it opens up your heart. Most of you are, are a little bit older than me. Honestly, most of you have grandkids that are my age or older. Most of you have been in church longer than I've been alive. I pray that it would open up your heart and show you areas where where you still need to grow. God knows it's shown me. It would show you areas of rebelliousness. It would show you areas where, where, where maybe some things need to be laid before God in repentance. So you could be the greatest evangelist you could possibly be. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. Jesus is the one that I I called the good and better Jonah because he's the good and better everything. For any good person you see is just just merely good. But Jesus is great. Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is God's Son, the one that, that is written in the Bible that we should forsake everything and follow Him. That being born anew by submitting to Jesus and following Jesus when God lifts our spiritual blindness is the way to eternity with Him as opposed to eternity in hell. But I suspect most of you are church people. And I would challenge you as we have our our time of response and, uh, and singing this last hymn. Would you honestly cry out to God and confess to him your areas of re- your areas of rebellion and disobedience, whether it be from omission or commission, whether you've done something wrong or you haven't done what he's called you to do. And if after all of this you still have nothing, you still think you have nothing to repent of, and you're just waiting for me to shut my mouth so we can all go eat lunch, would you ask God as we sing this last hymn? Would you ask God that he would open your hard heart so we can all together see the beauty of the gospel?